So today we're going to take a look at the WrestleMania 12 pay-per-view and those who follow the channel may think this is a bit random. Usually the pay-per-views I cover go along with the reliving the war timeline and all that but there's quite a few events I didn't cover during 1995 and 1996 and my plans to go back and cover all these shows eventually. There won't be any kind of schedule on these, they'll just appear randomly on the channel every now and then but by the time I hopefully get to the end of reliving the war every single pay-per-view from September 1995 will be covered. I think it's worth going back and filling in those blanks plus it gives me a great excuse to watch more pay-per-views. Anyway, WrestleMania 12 took place in Anaheim, California in front of around 19,000 fans. The show's headlined by a WWF Championship Ironman match pitting champion Bret Hart against Royal Rumble winner Shawn Michaels. We've also got an Undertaker vs Diesel grudge match in the semi-main spot and we've got a Hollywood backlot brawl featuring Goldust and Roddy Piper. Our commentators Vince McMahon and Jerry Lawler welcome us to Wrestlemania. McMahon seems all fired up for tonight's extravaganza but he's interrupted by Vader's music. So we're going to start things off with a 6 man tag. Vader, Davey Boy Smith and Owen Hart representing Kemp Cornette versus Yokozuna, Ahmed Johnson and Jake Roberts. Yokozuna left Kemp Cornette and this one's all about the big man getting some revenge. If the heel team gets defeated then Yokozuna's going to get 5 minutes all alone with Jim Cornette and Yokozuna can do anything he wants. And I do mean anything. Vader debuted just 2 months earlier and around this time there were big plans for Vader in the World Wrestling Federation including a title run. And over on the babyface side, Ahmed Johnson was in the midst of a decent babyface push. There's no time wasted at all here as the two big men of the match start throwing punches at each other. The babyfaces then clear out the ring and Ahmed Johnson decides to jump over the top rope and Vader gets taken out. Ahmed would not be doing moves like this even a year later. Yokozuna takes a ton of strikes from Vader but Yoko doesn't go down. Owen Hart gets tagged in and he tries drop kicking Yoko from behind but again Yoko won't go down and the King of Hearts takes a clothesline for his troubles. Davey saves Owen from getting squashed in the corner and Owen chokes Yoko from the apron after tagging Vader back in. Yokozuna finally goes down after more punches from Vader but he comes back with a Uranagi that makes the ring shake. This looked awesome. Ahmed Johnson comes in and he takes care of Owen and Davey. Vader decides to back off until after Johnson performs a power slam. Vader tries to squash Ahmed after a sunset flip but the move misses and Johnson pulls off a jumping clothesline. You know, just watching Ahmed throughout 1997 and reliving the war makes you realise how different he was during his first few months in the company. Owen saves Bulldog from a Pearl River plunge and the King of Hearts follows this up with an enziguri. Vader does a little damage before Owen tries to knock Ahmed down with a clothesline but that didn't work out too well. Ahmed floors Owen and Ahmed tags in a fired up Jake Roberts. Jake throws punches at all his opponents but Owen hangs onto the ropes before Jake can hit his DDT. A knee in the corner stuns Jake and Bulldog comes back in with a front face lock. An unorthodox front face lock where Jake's seated and Davey's standing up. Big Vader's back in now and he totally messes Jake up with right hands in a big corner splash. Yokozuna looks on as if to say fuck. Owen delivers a smooth elbow drop from the top rope and Davey plans on finishing the match with his running power slam but Jake the snake kicks out and Davey can't believe it. Vader tries to finish the job with a splash but again Jake kicks out. Davey's like fuck this, leg drop time but Jake moves out of the way and Jake totally ignores Ahmed to tag in Yokozuna. Yokozuna annihilates Vader in the corner and the crowd goes crazy. Bulldog and Owen get taken out too and Davey takes a Samoan drop. Yoko then tags Jake back in so you know what's happening in here, Ahmed's getting protected and Jake's gonna take the loss. The referee's distracted with everyone fighting on the outside while Jake plants Owen with a DDT. There's no one to count the cover so Jim Cornette tries and fails to take Jake out with his trusty tennis racket. Vader gets back in the ring to take out Roberts. Roberts gets floored and then we see the Vader bomb. 1-2-3, Cam Cornette wins the opener at WrestleMania 12. Not the worst WrestleMania opener but you wouldn't rank it very highly either. Yokozuna doesn't get his 5 minutes alone with Jim Cornette unfortunately and Jim he can enjoy the rest of Wrestlemania without a flattened face. Roddy Piper vs Goldust takes place next in a Hollywood backlot brawl. 
This was originally supposed to be Razor Ramon vs Goldust in a Miami street fight but Razor got suspended before Mania and plans changed. Keep in mind that both Razor Ramon and Diesel had given in their notice around this time period. 1996 Goldust is peak Goldust for me. The character tried to push the envelope and Goldust tried to make viewers and his opponents feel uncomfortable through the man games he would play. The Goldust character in these early days was like nothing we had seen before. WWF acting president Roddy Piper though was someone we were all familiar with and Piper had one thing on his mind at WrestleMania, beating the hell out of Goldust. Piper thought Goldust was a man who was trying to get attention and Piper said Goldust had no pride as an intercontinental champion. Piper drew comparisons between Goldust and Adrian Adonis and if Piper could beat Adonis then Goldust shouldn't be any problems at all for the hot rod. The first part of the match was taped earlier, it's not live. Marlene is sitting backstage watching on a monitor and the champagne's already on ice. We go to the back lot where Piper's standing with a baseball bat, Goldust Cadillac pulls up and Piper gives it a wash. What a nice guy. The hot rod then smashes the passenger side window and Goldust gets out of his car only to get greeted with Piper and his baseball bat. Goldust gets his head slammed on a nearby table and Roddy uses a trash can to do more damage. And everything looks very stiff here. No doubt these two agreed to lay it in before recording the match. Goldust gets thrown into the side of a dumpster, Roddy kicks Goldust while he's down, and Goldust gets a six pack of dad coke thrown in his face too. Piper uses the hose to get Goldust on the hood of his gold Cadillac. Goldust gets slammed on the hood by the hot rod. Piper then body slams his opponent before performing a fist drop and Goldust then takes a hard punch to the head. Roddy punches Goldust again when both men are away from the Cadillac and yeah, he definitely got him with that one. Goldust finally does something, a low blow. Piper then gets his head slammed into the side of a dumpster and Goldust jumps in his car. He reverses into Piper's Ford Bronco and Goldust then drives his car right into the hot rod. Piper takes a ride on top of the car before falling off. Goldust drives off and Piper gets in his Bronco to start a chase around the main streets of Hollywood. It's a memorable backstage brawl, even if it did feel a little out of place during a WrestleMania event in this time period. But the match isn't over yet, we're going to come back to this one a little later on. Million Dollar Champion Steve Austin makes his WrestleMania debut next against Savio Vega and it's a little strange seeing Austin in a WrestleMania match that, if we're totally honest about, not many people cared about. Also, the Vega vs Austin feud would continue after WrestleMania so someone thought pairing these two up would be a good idea. This is not the ringmaster, Austin gets announced as Stone Cold Steve Austin and the match starts off with both guys throwing punches yet neither man getting an advantage. You'd think they had a really, really heated rivalry here. On the outside, Savio goes for Ted DiBiase and he snuffs out a sneak attack from Stone Cold, but back inside the ring, Austin gets the better of Savio and Vega gets thrown into the ring post. We get to see the more technical side of Steve Austin with arm bars, wrist locks and hammer locks, but Savio goes up and over Stone Cold and Savio performs a nice super kick. Roddy Piper then calls in and he says, and I quote, if that fruitcake Goldust thinks that's the way their match is gonna end, then Goldust thought wrong. Piper then gets cut off but it sounds like Piper's involved in a good old fashioned car chase. Austin works over the arm and shoulder before locking in an arm bar. Stone Cold then performs a hammerlock slam when Savio again tries to go up and over and we then see the Steve Austin second rope elbow drop. Piper's called in again and he's going on about making a man out of Goldust before again getting cut off. Savio performs a crossbody, Austin comes back with a Luthez press, Savio counters that with a pen attempt and Stone Cold then tries a cover of his own. The match continues on. Vega tries a backslide but Austin's worked over his arm so much that Vega can't perform the move. Aerial footage of Piper chasing Goldust is then shown, the white Ford Bronco speeding down the road reminded viewers of the OJ Simpson chase that was viewed by 95 million people. It did look very familiar, as in it is the actual footage. According to Bruce Pritchard, an OJ Simpson vs Roddy Piper match was actually discussed for WrestleMania and I'd say it's probably good that such a match didn't take place. Back in the ring, Savio delivers a spinning heel kick but Austin counters with a splash. Stone Cold then goes all the way to the top rope but Savio gets a boot up and Vega then fires up a little with a back body drop and two clotheslines. 
His spinning wheel kick knocks the referee out though and this gives DiBiase a chance to put the million dollar championship in the ring. Savio counters a million dollar dream attempt but the referee's still out, so Austin grabs the million dollar belt and Savio gets clocked not once but twice. The referee's still out as Austin applies a chin lock, Vince says it's a choke, I say it's a chin lock. DiBiase pours a drink all over the referee, Tim White wakes up and Austin wins when Savio can't raise his arm after a third attempt, a knockout victory for Stone Cold. Not great in my opinion, I know there's some out there who enjoy this match and it is significant in terms of Austin's career, but it's not a match I'd seek out and watch again. Big Diesel gets interviewed by Mr. Perfect, Diesel wrestles Taker tonight and their match is all about revenge. Diesel costs The Undertaker the WWF Championship at the Royal Rumble, Taker costs Diesel the Championship at February's In Your House show, so the two plan on settling things once and for all inside the ring tonight at WrestleMania. The best moment of the entire build up was Diesel opening a casket and finding himself lying inside it, spooky shit. Diesel says they don't call him Big Daddy Cool for nothing, he doesn't sweat the little things although he does admit Undertaker's a big obstacle. Diesel says he'll take care of the Undertaker tonight and then Diesel's gonna set his sights on the heartbreak kid Shawn Michaels. Next up we've got Hunter Hearst Hemsley vs The Ultimate Warrior, no build up for this one. It was announced on Raw that Warrior was gonna come back and his first appearance back was right here at WrestleMania. Sable makes her debut here as Hunter's valet and you all know what happens in this one. I will say this though to give it some credit, Warrior's entrance was fantastic and without a doubt he got one of the best pops of the entire night. Hemsley said that backstage Warrior wasn't very open to discussing what they could do in this match and it sounds like Warrior didn't speak to Hunter like a peer or an equal at all. Granted Warrior was a bigger star and not too many people were buying tickets to see Triple H in 1996 but it shows us where Warrior stood during this comeback. Hunter tries to take an early advantage and Warrior just shakes his head around while taking punches. Warrior gets hit with a pedigree and then he just stands up after taking Hemsley's finishing move. Hunter gets hit with a few clotheslines, Warrior performs a jumping shoulder block, we then see the gorilla press slam and the splash and Warrior covers Hunter. Warrior wins the match just like that. Now again to be fair, the audience loved it, I'm sure there were a few in the crowd who weren't very happy but the majority were on their feet cheering so there's that, but this match kinda lives on in infamy because of what Triple H would eventually become. If you already dislike the Ultimate Warrior then you're gonna dislike this match, pretty much the best way to put it. Backstage Todd Pettengill introduces the WWF's newest superstar Johnny B Bad, now known by his real name Mark Merrow, and by the look in Mark's eyes the gear backstage stage at WrestleMania 12 is of the highest purest quality. Mero says he's been waiting 5 years to make his WWF debut and Pettingill wonders if Mero's ready to face quality superstars like Warrior, Undertaker, Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels. Just as Mero was about to answer, Triple H bumps into him and Mark tells Hunter to watch it. Triple H then blames Sable for his loss and he punches Mero in the mouth. So Mark scoops Hunter up, there's a bump at the shutters here and the two have a fight. Not the best night for Triple H was it? We then see more footage of Piper's white bronco and yes in case you're wondering or in case it's not clear, they used footage from the OJ car chase. Diesel vs The Undertaker's up next, Vince says he's big, he's cool, he's big daddy cool. <laughs> big D walks out to a great ovation, Diesel was in tweener territory here but Taker does end up getting a better reception than Big Sexy. Nash said Vince wanted him to do three things as he was leaving the company, put over The Undertaker, put over Shawn Michaels and put over The Ultimate Warrior. Nash said he'd do the first two, no questions asked and Warrior would have to beat him in a real fight and pin him if he wanted to get put over. I've talked about this match in previous videos and it's one of those bouts I like more and more every Every time I watch it. For me the pairing of Diesel and The Undertaker didn't sound great but when they actually get to work in the ring they put on a good match and it's one of Diesel's finest WWF matches he ever had. Bret, Sean and Taker, those three in my opinion gave Big Daddy Cool his most memorable bouts. We get a fist fight to start us off and Taker goes into the turnbuckles hard after an Irish whip. Diesel tries again and Taker hits hard again but a big boot brings Taker into the match and Diesel's the first man off his feet after a clothesline. Taker misses an elbow 
elbow drop and Diesel sends the Phenom over the top rope. Taker lands on his feet and Big Daddy Cool takes some punishment, even getting his head rammed into the steps. Back inside the ring, Diesel manages to escape a tombstone attempt but Taker stays in control with a running crossbody, not a move we normally see from the dead man. We then see a classic Undertaker move, old school. It doesn't knock Diesel down and Big Daddy Cool manages to dodge the Undertaker's jumping clothesline. He can't capitalize however. Taker drops Diesel over the top rope and the match then goes back to the outside where Taker tries to use a chair. Diesel moves out of the way and the Undertaker ends up getting thrown into the guardrails. The Phenom then gets his back rammed into the ring post a few times and Big Diesel intimidates Paul Bearer before getting back in the ring. The crowd are now booing Big Daddy Cool. The match resumes with a big boot from Diesel and Taker's not looking so good right now. Diesel talks shit as he lays in a few hard shots and Diesel thinks he has this all figured out. Taker gets hit with snake eyes and Diesel follows up with a leapfrog body guillotine. Diesel poses to the audience with a big old smile on his face and now it's just a matter of time before Taker gets jackknifed. Diesel ends up wasting too much time and he doesn't go for his finisher, allowing Taker to fight back and both men hit the mat after they both go for a big boot. The referee gets the 8 before Taker sits up but Diesel goes back in control following a whip to the corner and a big old bear hug. This stays locked in for a minute or so and Taker gets out with a back suplex. Taker then hits that flying clothesline but Diesel kicks out. Big Daddy Cool knows he's in trouble so he pulls off a quick jackknife powerbomb when Taker goes for a backdrop but then he makes another crucial mistake, he doesn't cover the Undertaker. Diesel thinks the Undertaker's out but Taker sits up and the match continues on. Absolutely confident that he's got this one in the bag, Big Daddy Cool pulls off another jackknife and that should be it all over. Diesel now has a license to be a total dick and play up to the crowd and he uses it. He goes to cover the dead man but Taker's still in it. Undertaker grabs Diesel by the throat but Diesel fights Taker off. Taker does it again and this time the Phenom gets to his feet. We don't see the choke slam though, we see a back suplex from Diesel. Diesel again poses to the audience and he doesn't notice the Undertaker standing up behind him. This was Big Sexy's last mistake. We see Taker's jumping clothesline, we see the choke slam from the Phenom, the Undertaker signals for the tombstone and Diesel gets planted into the canvas for the three count. A fun match here in my opinion and one that I originally didn't care much for but again I've grown to like this one after a few repeat viewings. Diesel's out cold in the middle of the ring as the Undertaker's music plays in the arena and Diesel now had one more guy he needed to put over before leaving the company. Small side note, Taker got handed divorce papers the night before Mania 12 which couldn't have been easy. Nash joked when he said he thinks a few of the kicks he took at Wrestlemania were for the Undertaker's wife. Todd pettengill has been keeping his eye on the OJ Simpson footage and he concludes that Roddy Piper and Goldust are heading back to the arena. Piper almost takes the door off Goldust's car but Goldust gets out and he and Marlena head into the arena. Goldust and Piper end up getting in the ring to continue their fight with no referee and it's Goldust who takes the lead. Goldust puts a big old target on Piper's knee and after doing some damage Piper takes a leg drop to the balls. Goldust plays up to his character when going for a pile driver, he feels Roddy's ass. Piper counters but he ends up taking a low blow for his efforts. Piper gets his shirt ripped off and Goldust uses it to choke the hot rod and Goldust wants to target the knee again and the hot rod takes a shot at the ring post. Piper ends up on the mat and Roddy takes a few right hands. Goldust tries to kiss Piper but Roddy shakes him off before taking more punches. Goldust goes to the top rope, Piper shakes the rope and Goldust loses his balance but then Goldust kisses Piper and that appears to be one step too far. Piper gets some insane Hulk Hogan no selling abilities and he fucking destroys Goldust, even giving him the old sausage lock before dropping a knee on the bizarre one's nutsack. Piper then rips off his opponent's ring attire and he returns the favour with a big old kiss. The crowd pops when they see Piper in his lingerie and Piper ends it with one more knee to the nuts. I think that means Piper just won the Hollywood backlot brawl. Certainly one of the more unusual matches we have seen at Wrestlemania. I definitely preferred the first part of this match but yeah there you have it. Alright it's time for the Iron Man match, Bret Hart vs Shawn Michaels. I'm not gonna go right into this one because I have a real problem summarizing things and I'll end up talking about this all night, but I'll talk about some highlights and I'll refer back to an old video I made on this match and some of the more interesting points raised in that video. 
Shawn Michaels won the 1996 Royal Rumble after being out with an injury, a storyline injury. Owen Hart's insecurity knocked HBK out and the company went with a concussion angle in the run up to the Rumble. But HBK eliminated Diesel at the end of the match and HBK was on his way to WrestleMania. Brett and Sean were friendly enough heading into the match and Roddy Piper was the one who announced that this was going to be a 60 minute Ironman match where the person with the most falls wins the bout. And most of the build up was spent with Sean and Brett scouting each other on Raw and the WWF produced a ton of training videos showing how the competitors were getting prepared for the big match. A changing of the guard was in the air that night though, HBK's babyface push was insane around this point of his career and it was obvious too that the World Wrestling Federation were going to go with Michaels as their new champion. But one would imagine a 60 minute match would favour the more grounded style of Bret Hart while Sean could get out of breath if he tried to go full throttle from bell to bell. This match really has fans torn and there seems to be no middle ground, people either really like it or they don't. Personally, I enjoy it but I'm biased too because I like both the guys competing in the ring, but I can absolutely see why others wouldn't like it. You gotta appreciate the booking of this one though, a 60 minute match at Wrestlemania. A 60 minute match during this era when the company weren't necessarily known for putting on long bouts on any show at all. It was a ballsy move back then and I'm glad the match took place. It's a historic main event whether you enjoyed it or you didn't think much of it. Sean's entrance was equally historic on this night with the Heartbreak Kid coming down to the ring on a zipline. It's one of WrestleMania's most iconic entrances. HBK seems very prepared and very confident as he gets in the ring and his theme music plays inside the Anaheim Pond. Bret Hart gets a thunderous ovation too on his way to the ring and both guys definitely have their own set of fans here at WrestleMania. It's a big babyface versus babyface encounter and there would have been fans here too who liked both guys equally. It makes for a good match dynamic. Now, in that old video I put together, I watched this bout very, very closely from start to end while counting rest holds and high spots. What we always hear is that this match is filled with way too many rest holds and there's critics out there stating that half of the match being spent on the mat was way too much. In that previous video, and I'm just being honest, I set out to prove a lot of those critics wrong and in the end we learned that around 15 and a half minutes of the match was spent in rest holds. There were 24 rest holds in total and admittedly for a 1 hour match there was a low number of high spots, 14. Still, a 60 minute match where a quarter of it spent in holds really isn't all that bad and it's nowhere near what others make it out to be, but having 24 rest holds in total does make it feel like there's a lot more time spent in those holds. Still though, it's not that bad. Something else I noticed when putting that video together and watching the match closely is that Brett and Sean cut the match up into different segments and they placed little markers for themselves within the match like this spot needs to happen at this time, that spot needs to happen at that time and then go into the next segment, things like that. It's meticulously put together and this can be seen as a good thing or a bad thing but it is worth noting. So again I'm not going to go into this one in detail today but let me briefly tell you what happens. The first 10 minutes is all about Sean proving he can hang in there with the hitman when it comes to submission counters and applying submissions of his own. The hitman takes Sean down a few times with side headlocks but the heartbreak kid surprises the commentators by catching Brad out a few times with submission moves of his own. Around the 51 minute mark Sean pulls off a chin lock counter into a hammer lock and why people weren't doing this against Davy Boy Smith I'll never no. Right after the first 10 minutes Brett flies out of the ring after a head scissors and the next segment begins. More submission counters but now with more strikes and more moves. Things get a little more heated when the match goes to the outside, at the 15 minute mark we see that glorious timekeeper super kick and the competitors go back to pacing themselves in the ring while officials and medics check on the timekeeper. And the next part is all about HBK getting the better of Brett after the hitman gets thrown into the ring post. HBK pulls off a few moves he normally wouldn't do here, including a shoulder breaker and a hammerlock slam as the challenger targets the left shoulder and arm. Brett just can't get a break at this point as HBK continues to wear down the champion. Brett begins a comeback as we reach the 30 minute mark and right when we reach the halfway point we see a referee bump. 
from here, the pace picks up quite a bit with a power slam from Sean, a pile driver from Brett, and HBK jumping on Brett from the top rope to the outside. Back inside the ropes, Brett fights out of a sleeper and Sean gets backdropped out of the ring, and now it feels more like a standard wrestling match and the use of rest holds is limited. Sean had his chance earlier and now it's all about Brett. The hitman works over Sean's lower back here and the heartbreak kid takes a lot of punishment. For almost 20 minutes, Brett stays in control with Sean only managing a few counters, so the hitman definitely got his shit in here. Sean tumbles out of the ring and he gets thrown into the steel steps, Brett also performs a dive through the ropes that wipes HBK out. Back in the ring, Brett almost gets a pinfall after a standing switch followed by a German suplex, and it isn't until around the final 7 minutes or so where Sean starts to make a proper comeback, though it still stays pretty back and forth. With 5 minutes left, Sean boots Brett in the face, the hitman takes a dropkick, Sean hits his flying forearm and the crowd are pumped up at this point, they can sense HBK's gonna win it. Sean pulls off a jumping back elbow, a double axe handle from the top rope, we see the signature elbow drop but Brett keeps kicking out. A moonsault and pin combo also fails to put Brett away and it feels like Brett's now in survival mode as HBK keeps it up with a hurricane rana. These last few moments were absolutely incredible. Brett takes a body slam and HBK goes upstairs one more time as the crowd gets more anxious. Sean jumps off the top rope but Brett catches him and he applies the sharpshooter. It's now Sean Michaels that's in survival mode and there's no way he's leaving now with that championship belt. He can't win, there's not enough time time. Sean stays in the sharpshooter for the remaining 30 seconds of the match. He doesn't submit so we have no falls at the end of the 60 minutes and therefore the match is a tie. Bret Hart is still WWF champion. Bret leaves the ring but new WWF president Gorilla Monsoon enters. Gorilla talks to Earl Hebner and Hardfinkel makes an announcement. The match is gonna continue, there must be a winner and it's sudden death. Whoever gets the first fall wins the championship. Bret looks pissed off as he hits heads back to the ring and he plans on taking it out on Sean. The hitman viciously attacks Sean's back and the heartbreak kid takes a big back body drop. Brett then whips Sean into the corner but Sean counters and he hits the super kick. Sean doesn't get all of it though, Brett gets back to his feet and the hitman takes sweet chin music one more time. This time Brett stays down and Sean Michaels wins the match in sudden death overtime. Brett is fucking livid, there's a moment here where Sean legit told Earl to tell Brett to get out of the ring and if you look closely it appears that Sean also sent a message for Jose Lothario to get out of the ring too, what a nice young man. Brett storms off while HBK looks down at the belt, the boyhood dream comes true, Sean wins the big one and now the heartbreak kid's gonna lead the company throughout 1996. I've got a soft spot for WrestleMania 12. I watched it quite a few times when I was younger and some of it still holds up very well today. I enjoy the Iron Man match, though your mileage may vary. Diesel vs The Undertaker is another match I enjoy. And the first part of the backlot brawl is pretty fun too. It's an odd WrestleMania with so much time getting dedicated to the main event and the 60 minute match definitely casts a big old shadow over everything else. So I think those who don't really like the Iron Man match won't really like WrestleMania 12 either. But I like the event and I'd say I've probably watched WrestleMania 12 more than any other WrestleMania. Anyway, that's going to do it for this one. Do keep an eye on the channel for more of these because I do want to get caught up on the late 95 and 1996 pay per views that I didn't cover. So I'll try to cover a WCW one next time. Leave a comment and let me know which one I should cover next. Just please, please, not Halloween Havoc 1995. Thanks for watching, guys, and take care. Thanks for watching this WrestleMania 12 video and a big thanks to Nathan, Patrick and Adam for supporting on Patreon at the Hall of Fame tier. Early video access and the music remixes you hear on wrestling bios are available over on Patreon so if you want to see stuff early and also help keep the channel a little more secure then check out what's on offer on Patreon. Again a big thanks to Hall of Famers Nathan, Patrick and Adam and everyone else who supports the channel.